custom of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem unto the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. And, and as I studied this this morning, it blew my mind how many hands he went through. Felix, Agrippa, I can't remember the other one. He went through three or four different rulers of the land who found him innocent, but still sent him on towards Rome. Praise God. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest for us concerning this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him, unto his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning Ooh, you talk about a long sermon talk about a long sermon some of you think we preach long from morning till evening Praise God. Amen. From morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Praise God. That's the way it always is. Hallelujah. And I always say I'm there for them that want it. Praise God. Praise God. You're never going to reach the ones that don't want it. The only ones you're ever going to reach is the ones that want it. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Let's raise our hands and ask the Lord to minister to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we ask God for your divine action this morning. Preach to these ears, O God, that hear. Cause these hearts to receive, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give glory and honor and praise to thee. In thy name, praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. I hope this morning that I am speaking to some spiritual people this morning because if you're not a spiritual person, this is not going to do you any good at all. Praise God. Is there anybody in here this morning that want to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ? If there's anybody here this morning that wants to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, then I'm here to minister to you this morning. Praise God. Because I want to minister on this thought this morning to you, witnessing in adversity. Praise God. Anywhere we go, if you look in the second chapter of Acts, you will find on the day of Pentecost, there were those there that received. There were those there that mocked. There were those there that caused trouble. They're always there. Always. Praise God. We turn to the second book of Acts and we read about these that were there. We find that every one of them were speaking in other tongues, but we find many people there from many nations. Amen. And we find people there that are just beside themselves and this 
Satan don't want me to preach to you people this morning. I'm looking at this saying, how in the world can this be? I had the third chapter of Acts. Praise God. In verse 13 of the second, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. See? There's those that there in verse 12 that are amazed. And then there's there in verse 12 that are doubters. And then in verse 13, there's mockers. You've always got them. But what you want to stay keyed in on and focused to is not the mockers. Did you notice because of our egotism, we notice the mockers? Because of our flesh, we notice the doubters. Somehow or another, we got to get into the spiritual room and the spiritual realm and find the hungry. They're always there too. Always there. Praise God. They will always be in the midst of the mockers and the doubters. Praise God. I'm glad this morning for that which hungers and thirsts after righteousness because my Bible said they shall be filled that's the ones I'm looking for you know when I go fishing I don't always bring all the fish home hallelujah I go fishing I catch a carp I turn it loose I don't care how big it is I turn it loose or throw it up on the bank Praise God. And I know there's a lot of folks wouldn't like that, but I don't never do what folks like. I do what makes me feel good. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, Sister Neri, I was cleaning a bunch of uh, catfish one time when Sister Gant was there. And all of those catfish was just, oh, my Sister Gant would have had a fit. She'd have watched me clean those fish about two weeks ago. They, every one of them was just full of eggs. And uh, I was throwing all those fish away with those eggs in them. And she come out there. She said, you don't throw no more of those fish away. I said, really? She said, no. I said, why? She said, because they're full of eggs. Those eggs good to eat. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, get all of them you want. <laughs> Praise God. I'll help you get them. I ain't helping you eat them. Hallelujah. Praise God. But you can eat all of them you want. You can have all of them you want. Praise God. I took the part of the fish I wanted and I let her have the part she wanted. Amen. And she makes them look good. And, and oh my, I eat a whole lot of stuff she fixed, but I didn't eat those eggs. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's the way they do it. That's the way they live. And they enjoy their food. Amen. Praise God. Just like we enjoy ours. Praise God. I love everything the Spanish fix except pastries. Amen. I tell you what. The, the, the Spanish people can make pastries look so beautiful. But when you sink your teeth in them, there's no sugar in them. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> and us folks have already got that sugar in there, so we're used to it. Amen? Hallelujah. But boy, did I like to try to kill myself at Anchor Inn last night. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's some mighty good stuff some of you folks fixed last week. Amen. I like to try to kill myself last Sunday afternoon, too. Amen. On some of the things that folks in the church brought. Hallelujah. I don't tell you it's good. <clears throat> but how did I get on that? Difference. The difference of us people. Always somebody mocking, right? Always somebody scoffing. Because of our differences, right? Amen? But I'm here to tell you we need to look in the middle of all of this stuff for the nugget of gold. Many of you ever been where they pan for gold? You never been there? 
you ought to go sometime. It's fun. You get out there. You know what? You'll just know you're finding gold. And what you're finding is fool's gold. Amen. But in the midst of all that fool's gold is a real nugget if you ever find one. And I had a friend one time that found one that weighed almost two ounces. That's a lot of money. Praise God. Praise God. And uh, that one little nugget of gold was worth around $1,000. Praise God. I want to tell you something. <clears throat> That's what we're looking for when we're out witnessing. Oh, I know where I was talking about fish. Yeah, I, I don't always keep all the fish. I throw bunches of it back in, but I bring home the nice ones, the big ones. The, somebody said, how come you don't keep the little ones? I want them to grow up. Praise God, in the big ones. So I throw the little ones back in, give them time to grow up. I had a buddy one time. He took home all of the fish he caught that day. He's going to prove to me that he could catch more than me. When it comes time to clean them, I said, well, I'll see you later. Praise God. Because I, I wasn't about to try to clean all those fish about that long. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. Ain't much you can do with a fish that long. Bite its head off and, you know, just eat what you can. Praise God. Hallelujah. Some of you look like you're hungry this morning. You tickle me. Praise God. I want to tell you, I don't keep all the fish. There is things out there in the water I don't want to eat. Praise God. I remember one day my dad caught a snake on a fishing pole. And my dad's worse than I ever was about snakes. He just throwed the pole in the water and took off up over the hill. Praise God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you just don't keep everything that comes out of the water. Amen. And what are you saying, Brother L? That's the way it is when you're out power witnessing for Jesus. When you go into a house, you can, uh, you can believe there'll be two devils in there. I walked by last night in the hospital to see Brother Sean. This man staring at me. And I looked at him. You know, some of you don't believe this stuff, and I don't care what you believe. My son won't preach it to his church. That's shame on him. But he told me on the phone this week, he said, I don't think my church can handle it. I said, you better start getting them where they can. I walked up and I looked at that dude, and that dude was so full of demons it wasn't funny. I said, a witch doctor is what he is. He's, he's a witch doctor practicing witchcraft. Amen. I... I stared at him as I walked in. I wanted him to know he didn't have any power in him. That's right. Ain't nobody full of devils got any power. They just think they do. You think you've got some power? Come up here and lay your hands on me. I dare you to. I put my hands on you and start rebuking them devils out of you in the name of Jesus Christ and show you up for everything you are. I walked by smiling at him as I come out, but I said, that dude's more trouble for this hospital and they know what to do with in here. And as I walked out, two great big burly sheriffs walked in. I didn't have to ask what was going on. I knew what was happening. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. They never catch on. People never catch on that the devil make fools out of them every time. Amen. Satan will make a fool out of you. They probably took that dude and handcuffed him up and took him in last night. He ain't got enough sense to know that serving the devil is making a slave out of him. But every time you walk into a house, you're going to have demonic people around that's going to try to put this message down and this gospel down. Amen. They're full of devils. Hallelujah. There's nothing about this gospel to mock or to scoff. Anytime you're mocking this gospel, you are full of the devil. 
anytime you're, go you're scoffing this message, you're full of the devil. The devils in hell hate this message. Praise God. But inside of all of that is always somebody there that's hungry. You know, I used to go out with a bunch of people that was just a bunch of unbelievers. And you say, what's that, brother? Oh, I'd go fishing with them. You know, we'd fish for an hour, two or three. Didn't catch nothing. You know what they say? They said, well, the fish ain't biting today. Said, so might as well go home. So we all folded up our tent and went home. But I've since fished with fishing guides. And I have learned something about fishing with fishing guides. That every day fish are biting. You just have to find out what they will eat. And you have to find out how to feed them. You can't go out there and do today what you did yesterday. Praise God. But they are eating every day. Somewhere in the lake, fish are eating every day. Praise God. How many of you believe we have a message somebody's hungry for every day? Every day, there's somebody in the pond that wants this message. It is. You understand that what Paul is going through, Paul is, I thought, you know, how many of you have ever sit in court? How many of you ever been on the witness stand? Isn't that a fun place to be? Isn't that a wonderful place to have lawyers cross-examining you to find out what kind of liar you are? They will find out what kind of liar you are. And if they can't find out you're a liar, they'll make one out of you if they can. They'll take your words and twist them up and say things you never said. But the beautiful about thing about the truth is, you just keep telling the truth over and over and over. It can't get twisted up. I've had them say, sir, you said, I said, no, I didn't say you said. Go back to the record what I said. You better be smart enough to remember what you said. Praise God. Let me tell you something. When you're sitting on the witness stand, it's a tough spot. Did you know that Paul sat there four or five times before he got... Did you know they beat Paul up? They would have killed him if the officers would have lit him. Those Jews would have killed him for telling them that Jesus Christ died for them and that they had to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost to be saved. They would have killed Paul for that. But those officers wouldn't let him. You know what he was doing in every situation? He was witnessing about the Lord. And every time he stood on the witness stand, he found hungry people in the courtroom. And if you understood what I read to you today, it said, and some believed, and some believed not. Paul didn't care how hard it was. He was only out for one thing. To find them that was hungry for the gospel. I've had people tell me I'm not knocking doors anymore. I'm tired of people telling me that, that, that you know, uh, what are you out here knocking doors for? Ain't you got something better to do? Well, let me tell you something. I suppose they tell the Baptists that. I suppose they tell the Mormons that. I suppose they tell the Jehovah Witness that, but it don't stop them from knocking doors. How many of you think we ought to be out there since we have the message? The real message of deliverance. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. It ought to be us out there. 
finding that one that's hungry. Finding that one that needs the gospel. Oh, Brother Elder, what about that one that said this? All we're worried about is our name. All we're worried about is our ego. All we're worried about is our flesh. What about the hungry out there that's waiting on somebody to knock their door and come to them? Praise God. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you something, church. we got a message to preach, but I'm afraid sometimes we don't preach it. You can't preach, Brother Elder. Most of the folks in this town don't know me. There's some folks that know me and don't like me. But somebody said, I've heard a lot of stories about you. I said, well, I sure hope they're good. He said, oh, all of my herd's good. I said, I'm glad you're talking to the right person. Because all of them ain't good. Don't you feel bad, Brother Elder, if somebody speaks bad about you? No. Because my Bible said, beware when all men speak well of you. You know what it means when all men speak well of you? You're a compromiser. You don't stand for nothing. You just want to be everybody's buddy. You don't care nothing about Jesus Christ and standing up for Him. That's not me. Leave me out of that. Here I am, Lord. You can count on me. Praise God. I'm a man. I got some backbone in me. Little old spineless yellow things want everybody to love them. Everybody think they're okay. Hello. Praise God. Hello. It takes a man to live for God. Stand up to the world and his buddies and say, I'm going to live for God no matter what you do. Praise God. Praise God. It takes a real woman to live for God. Step out and say, hey, I don't care what you think. I'm going to church and I'm living for God. I don't care what you do. Stay home. Play with the dog. Play with the cat and feed the fish. I'm going to church. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'll tell some of you women something. It's easy to go to church when your husband's going with you. Ain't so easy when he ain't. But I'm tell you what. God will honor you whether you go to church with or without your husband. Amen. I watched my mother go without hers. Amen. Somebody said, yeah, she lost him. She's going to lose him anyhow. I've seen women get out of the church so they wouldn't lose their husband. You know what happened? They lost them anyhow. I've seen people get out of church for something. You know what happened? The very thing they gave up God for, God took away from them. God will do it every time. Every time. I've never seen it fail in all the 40 some odd years I've been walking with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You don't give up nothing for God but what He comes in and says, I'll take that and more. And I'll teach you that when I bless you to be thankful. I was reading the 51st chapter of the book of Psalms this week and God said, I'm going to break my silence. I had a woman walk up to me Friday night and I got through preaching. Told me about her son-in-law that had quit going to church after going to church for years. And I looked at her and I said, I'm going to tell you what you do. You go home and you tell him, Brother Elder said, that God has given him a space of time to repent and get back in church. But you tell him to read the 51st chapter of the book of Psalms. And God said, when I break my silence, right now God's being good to him. God hasn't cast no judgment on him. God hasn't done this to him. And God hadn't done that. But I said, you tell him, I said, that if he keeps it up, God's going to break his silence. And all hell is going to break loose on his head. Some people take God's silence as though God don't care about them. 
Let me tell you something. God cares about you. And he'll be silent for a while. But when you keep laughing at him and going on your own pernicious ways. When he breaks his silence. You're going to find out how much you wished you'd have cared about him. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, don't preach that judgment stuff to me, Brother Elder. I'm going to preach it. You know why? I'm going to get your blood off my hands. So when I meet Jesus Christ, I don't have your blood on my hands. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You see, Paul, when he was in Acts 26 chapter in the 18th verse, Paul was speaking and he said this to them. <clears throat> And in my Bible, it's all red letter. When God knocked Paul down in the middle of the day and called him to ministry, he said, I've called you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. How many of you believe that God has brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light that we might transform it into others? God don't bring us into this marvelous light to sit on a pew and pay our tithes and come to church, clap our hands and kick our feet once in a while. He brought us into this marvelous light to get out and tell the others, hey, I want to tell you something. God's got something for you like He did for me. Every week we have a chance to testify. Do you take it? You say, I'm shut in. I can't get out. I will guarantee you God will send people to your door. Ain't no such a thing as being locked up and can't testify. Hallelujah. I believe in testifying Sunday afternoon for dinner. That's right. You don't want me to preach to you. You better stay away from my table and not even pour water or coffee for me. I'll preach to you. Praise God. Amen. Why, Brother Elder? i got to meet the Lord one of these days. You don't have to have cars and houses and lands to testify. All you got to have is a wonderful experience of the Holy Ghost and being set free from the world. That's all you got to have. You may have to come to church on a bicycle, but I'll tell you what, you're more blessed than the man that went to church in a Cadillac this morning, come out of the church and went home with nothing. He went to church with nothing, sit in the church service, got nothing, and went home with nothing. If you come on a bicycle this morning and God renewed you in the Holy Ghost and baptized you with His fire and you rode your bicycle home this morning, you got ten times more than the man that drove the Cadillac home. Hallelujah. Brother, this ain't got a thing to do with materialism. This has got something to do with your personal experience and walk with Jesus Christ. I don't find anywhere where Paul ever had a Cadillac. Probably the best thing that he ever drove a road on was a ship. And it was always getting busted up. And he was always floating around on a plank, roasting out there. Hoping he wouldn't get ate by the sharks. Anybody of you don't believe there's sharks in the Mediterranean Sea? You just don't know much. Amen. Because they're there. How do you know, Brother Eller? Because they talked about them while we were there. And I got to thinking. Floating around out there on a the plank. Mediterranean Sea is a pretty good sized piece of water. They're floating some mighty large battleships and, and U.S. aircraft carriers on it today. Not only U.S. aircraft carriers, I found out that Russia's floating aircraft carriers. I found out Russia's floating submarines. I found out that England's floating uh, carriers. I found out France is floating carriers. They're all of them out there in the Mediterranean Sea today. They don't even have a bit of trouble running into each other because that's a big spot. I want to tell you something, floating around out there on a plank would be some more. Talk about wanting and needing Jesus.
you get on a plank of wood out there in a puddle of water like that and <laughs> I imagine some of you was on a plank of wood out here in one of these sand pits be praying let alone in a place like that where the waves can get up to 10, 15 feet without even trying that's on a nice day we was going out fishing in the port golf I was on a 42 foot ship that ain't a very big one that's a little one Sister Elder and I have rode bigger ones than that. In fact, is she's been up on the deck of the Queen Mary. That thing is 72 feet above the water. You look down there, your stomach starts churning. I quit looking over the side. I said, this is kind of sickening. <clears throat> Praise God. And we was out in eight foot water that day. I said, what do you mean eight foot? 80 feet out, or 80 miles out in the Gulf, eight feet water. What are you talking about? Eight foot swells. That's just about as high as that door right there, swelling up eight foot, just rolling. And the old captain come walking out on the ship, and I got to talk with him. He said, "Oh, it's a pretty nice day out here today." I said, "Ought to catch a lot of fish." And we did. Everybody just filled their sacks up, gunny sacks. Amen. Some of them filled huge coolers up with fish four and five feet long. Just a nice day out here today. But I'll tell you what, riding around on a plank of wood would be kind of rough. Praise God. Paul did all of that preaching the gospel. Any of us done anything rough preaching the gospel? Hmm? Any of you ever had your back whipped with 39 lashes with a whip that would tear you open over preaching the gospel, but he did five times. Jesus only got it one time. He got it five times. They say that when they whipped a man like that, they, if they hit him the 40th time, they had to go on and kill him with the whip. So they whip him 39 times to keep from killing him. And they said a man had lay with his entrails hanging out of his back for days in fever and everything else trying to recuperate. Paul did it five times preaching the gospel. We're scared to go out and knock doors. Come on, how many of you think it's time to witness in adversity? Hello, church. Where are you at this morning? Did the Lord really give you anything to be happy about? To declare? To give to your brother and your sister, your neighbor? Come on. Your boss. Don't be afraid of your boss. I, I know Brother Urshan told the story one time of a milkman that delivered the milk to him for years. I already forgot, but I think it was 20 years. He said that man delivered milk at his house and the man was going through a divorce and was going through some things and the man come up one day and put the milk on the porch and Brother Urshan looked at him and said, you don't look so happy today. And he began to tell Brother Urshan why he wasn't happy. And Brother Urshan invited him to his church and the man broke down and started crying and bawling and said, 20 years I delivered milk to your house and not one time did you ever invite me to your church. Who are we passing up today that's right in our midst that's hungering and thirsting for the truth and the righteousness of God? Whew. Somebody says, what do we tell them, Brother Elder? What do we tell them? You turn to Mark, the 16th chapter. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. We preach the gospel. Amen. We preach the gospel. Oh, you tell them, oh, you can't, you can't watch television you can't this you can't that no that ain't the gospel that ain't the gospel at all that's why you're not getting nowhere you're not preaching the gospel you're preaching you're preaching a clothesline message you can't preach that to somebody amen you got to get them converted my god and i go out fishing you know what we do I ought to bring my tackle box in here one of these days. I'll, bring, I'll just bring one of them because if I brought all of them, it'd just blow your minds. 
When I get on that boat, I put all three tackle boxes on. I got one tackle box that'll do anything. It's got lures in it. It's got hooks in it. It's got weights in it. It's got lead in it. It's got, it's got plastic worms in it. It's got stink stuff you put on your hands and put on the, so you smell like a fish. And when I catch a fish, you know what I do? I just rub my hands all over that fish. I want to get that fish all over me so I get it all over the bait. You must say, Ooh, yuck. Oh, yeah, you ain't no fisherman. I'm going to tell you what, fish don't like human beings sent. They want something that smells like them, and boy, they can smell it in the water for hundreds of feet. Amen. They can hear for hundreds of feet. You think, you think, on land, a hundred and a hundred feet on land, sound moves at 180 feet a second. In the water, it moves at 426 feet a second. Praise God. What are you saying, Brother Elder? I'd like some time for you to see my tackle box. Why? Well, we go out there and we throw... We catch them on twister tails a few days ago. So we start off with twister tails because that's what we was catching them on the other day. Don't work. What do we do? I don't know. Maybe I'll try a thin shad. So I throw a thin shad out there. Nothing works. Nothing hits. Maybe they're down deeper. So I tie a hot and tot on and throw it out there. And it starts diving and twisting hard. And all of a sudden, bam, something hits it. They're deeper. They're still hungry. What are you doing? You're looking till you find what works. Do you know, with this, we don't even have to worry. God gave us a certified gospel and it works every time. Praise God. But a lot of times it's all in the presentation. You know what? I can come in and be a witness to you, Sister Vivian, and I can absolutely make you hate me and hate this church. Or I can come in and be a witness to you and I can make you love the gospel and wonder about me. And I can be such a person that pretty soon you get to bear you like me and you like the gospel. I was fishing a few days ago and I wasn't getting nothing. I'd throw that line out there and I'd reel that line in. Not a thing happened. And I kept it up and kept it up and I got tired and I quit reeling so fast and I started reeling slower and kawam. I wasn't presenting it right. When I started presenting it right, I started filling up a stringer of fish. How many of you want the Lord to work on you to present this gospel in such a way at work? Praise God. Praise God. Make it taste good. My wife, she's a very sensitive person. She's very hard to trick. I mean, you know, I sat down last night at the table. I said, you'll like this piece of chicken. I flopped it on her plate. She looked at me like, I don't want your piece of chicken. <laughs> she took a bite of it, and she said, I like that. It's good. I said, yeah, after 40 years, I know what you like and what you don't like. <laughs> Praise God. She can sit down at the supper table, and I can start eating. She said, how is it? And I said, it's okay. She said, don't tell me that. You don't like it. I can sit there and try to like it all I want to. I can't fool her. Praise God. Do you know we can present it to them and they like it or they don't like it? And if you're a sensitive person that's witnessed for Jesus Christ, you're going to pick up they don't like it. And so you're going to start your presentation different. 
You're not going to just keep, you know, you know, my wife, she says to me, well, if you don't like it, you can lump it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lump it. Right in the sink or the trash or there's something. Because we got to do something to where this stuff starts tasting better and doing better. I mean, I don't have to come home and eat for supper all the time and act hungry. I could get something to eat before I come home to supper and just act hungry. You don't have to lump it. There's other ways. I'm going to tell you something. The world doesn't have to lump this. There is other things they can eat. I just wonder how many of you want to get to where we present it till they're hungry for it and they want it. And our presentation is drawing them to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, you know what we do? We lift ourselves up. You know what we do? We lift the preacher up. You know what we do? We lift the church up. And it don't work. Your presentation's wrong. You start to get to lifting up Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw them unto me. Why? Because it's him that takes care of the gospel. Read it. What is it? It's Mark 15 and 16. What? Read it. 16 and 15. Read it, Sister Elder. You got it? Go ye into all the world and preach. Everybody say the gospel. The gospel. Now you can preach Acts 2.38 all you want to because that's salvation. But this is the gospel. And preach the gospel. Some of us are not preaching the right thing. You know, you're saying, Well, I don't care what you use for bait today. I caught them the last time on worms. I've seen people do that. Come up beside me. Hey, you know, <laughs> it's funny. You stand there using worms, and this guy walks up beside you. And he throws minnows out there. Bam! He starts catching fish. And you're not catching nothing on worms. And you can say, well, I caught them the last time on worms. I ain't changing, babe. And you just get aggravated because you got two fish that day and he caught 40. When are you going to wake up and change bait? When are you ever going to wake up and change your presentation? Well, I've been out witnessing and nothing happens when I go out witnessing. I'll sure tell you one thing. I wouldn't testify that testimony. I'd get busy and find out what I'm doing wrong and start doing something that started working. Preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized. And when you get there, if you're on the job in the schoolhouse, you're going to have two janitors there that think you're a joke. And they're going to run down your church. And they're going to ridicule you. And they're going to ridicule the Bible. But you might have one standing there that's a teacher or student or something that is hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Present it in such a way that these two dumb fish don't want what you got but this one does. Hallelujah. Brother Billy was with me. Brother Brother uh, um, Carriker, Jack Carriker was with me fishing about a year ago. And that guy would pull out some shad about that long. And throw them, put them out there. And Brother Billy, he pulled one in about that long. And Ooh, he's excited. He thought he died and went to heaven. Praise God. Brother, Brother Carriker pulled one in. Oh, it's probably about that long. And he said, Oh, man, I'm going to mount this. I said, You're going to mount that minnow? He did, too.
Well, Billy, if I'm lying, get up and testify and tell this church I'm lying. I looked at that guy. I said, do you have any bait in there? He pulled out a shad about that long. I said, that's what I'm looking for. And I hooked that baby on. He said, now when he takes him, he'll hit it to kill it, to turn him around. Don't do nothing. I said, let it go. He'll come back and grab it and start running. And when he runs, set it on him. And I felt him hit it. And then I felt the line starting to go out of my reel. I said, mm, that dude's running. I reached over and locked that reel, and I set the hook on that dude and cross-eyed that dude. And I thought I got stuck. I said, man, I've hung up. I told the guide, I said, hey, man. I hung up. I thought it was running, and I hung up on something. And the guy stood up and looked at my string, and then he stood up and got on his seat and looked at my string, and he said, hung up nothing. He said, your string's going that way. I couldn't move that fish. I couldn't turn it around. I couldn't reel it in. on him and had to be careful because I pulled too hard to break the line. And then pretty soon I started reeling him in and I felt it give a little bit and start coming towards the boat some. And I started working it towards the boat. Working it towards the boat. And then a little bit I noticed my line's going out again. I said, hmm, I got me a good one this time. And I started working him some more and working him some more and I just about got him to the boat when the guide stuck the net out in front of him and that fish said, this ain't for me. He took off and we ain't seen him yet. I promise you, he wasn't that long. When he snapped that line, it sounded like a 22 shot went off and that guide said, man, you ever more lost a fish. I said, yeah, I know it. You know why? I hung into that kind of fish because that's what I was fishing for. I wasn't fishing for that. You can't catch one like that. Yeah, you can catch them that long all day, feeding them fish that long. But when you go use them bait that long, it'll choke that fish to death, try to swallow it. It takes a big fish to swallow that thing. What are you talking about, Brother Elder? Your presentation is what I'm talking about. What are you presenting? What are you catching? I'm not just talking about fishing this morning. Fishing is an art, so is spreading this glorious gospel. Praise God. I said, so is spreading this glorious gospel. It's an art. Hallelujah. It's something you work at to get good at. I admire a man that makes a living on the lake. Somebody says, oh yeah, I said, man, that's a life of Riley. Go live it. Get out there every day on that lake and have to produce. Not go fishing. Have to produce for all your clients who have paid you $300 a piece to fish today. You have to catch fish. I don't care if it is snowing. I don't care if it is 110 in the shade. I don't care if it is pouring down rain. You still got to do it. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, it ain't the life of Riley. I'm telling you, after watching those guides, I said, I don't want to be one of them. Uh, fishing's fun to me, and I don't want to turn it into horrible hard work. Amen. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you, they produce day in, day out. They bring boatloads of fish in day in, day out. I want to tell you something. we got a gospel that works. We ought to be bringing in boatloads of fish day in and day out. Day in and day out. Amen. Where are you at this morning, church? Where would you go to?
this gospel works. I'll tell you what. You think I'm bragging on my wife and I, I am. I've said to myself, I know somebody, if they could afford to put me and my wife under them and just let us go out and knock doors and teach teach home Bible studies, this woman and me would fill a man's church up. Why don't you do it here, Brother Eller? Because you can't do it in pastor. You can't be on both jobs at the same time. You can't be effective in both jobs at the same time. But I'm telling you, there's some people in here that can do it, but there's one thing you've got to do. This woman loves to go out and knock doors and witness and teach Bible studies. She'd rather do that than get on the organ and play it. That's where you got to get at. Loving to sit down. Oh, they blow smoke in my face. Poor little thing. You're a real soul winner. Scared death, sir. You've been smoking? Your clothes smell like smoke. Yeah, boy, you should have seen when I was smoking. I was teaching a Max 238 today and I had the whole thing on fire. There's more smoke and fire in that house than they've seen since they lived there. Oh Lord, this guy here is one of the hardest places there is to teach Bible study. I'm sitting here teaching his wife the Word of God and some crazy bird comes over and lands on my arm, looks up at me and says, what are you doing? Do you ever try to explain to a bird what you're doing when you're teaching the Bible? <laughs> I looked at that bird like, can you read them charts? <laughs> Praise, God. Praise, God. Praise God! It's fun out there! It's fun teaching Bible studies. It's fun winning people to the Lord. But you got to get past their cat. Let me tell you something. I look at a cat and I start crawling. I start saying in the name of Jesus, get yourself under control. My wife starts saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. His eyes will swell shut and big knots will come up on him. And you'd be surprised. We've taught Bible studies and it didn't even affect me. Somehow or another, the Holy Ghost got a hold of me and I didn't kill the cat. Fact is, I even pet the cat. What about dogs? Dogs don't bother me. As long as they go in the other room and mess on the floor. And I wouldn't have a dog in the house messing around for nobody. That dog can't take care of itself. Let it go outside and hang on chain. Praise God. I know some folks ain't like me. And if you've got a good house pet and it don't mess up your house, that's fine. And I ain't upset about it. And I ain't going to give you no trouble about it. But there ain't going to be no fish in my house. There ain't going to be no canaries in my house. There ain't going to be no dogs in my house. There ain't going to be no cats in my house. When I come in and lay down on my couch, I ain't worried about their hairs coming up my nose while I'm breathing. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if you like it and you enjoy it, just do it. Hallelujah. But when you go into other people's houses to teach Bible studies... You can't sit in there and say, I can't stand your dog hairs. You can't say, that stupid cat, I hate cats, I hate cats, I hate cats. You know, you don't even have to tell a cat you hate it. A cat take one look at you. I walk in a house and sit down, cats take a look at me. They start backing up under the table, looking at me, going, <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. 
I said, what's wrong with my cat? It never acts like that. Oh, it's just having a bad day. <laughs> Praise God. Dogs know when you don't like them too, boy. Amen. Don't ask me much about birds. I don't know much about them. Hallelujah. Praise God, but I know a little bit about dogs and cats. Hallelujah. You don't walk in there and say, Turn the television off. I'm here in the name of Jesus Christ to teach you a Bible study today. Oh, you know what I do? I just get me a chair, my great big old Bible study chart, and I walk over and put it up in front of the television, spread my big old Bible study chart out where nobody can see nothing. We have to look at what's on the Bible study chart. Most generally, they say, oh, oh, let me turn it off. Let me turn it off. I say, okay, that'd be fine. That'd be nice. Yeah. You got somebody that's hungry. They, they, they're hungry. Amen. I don't tell them don't smoke cigarettes while I'm teaching them Bible studies. I don't tell them that. It's their house. It's their house. They can do whatever they want to in their house. I ain't there to tell them what to do. I'm there to teach the glorious gospel to them and let the Word of God get a hold of their heart and change them and turn them around. It's all in how you're presenting it. Hallelujah. I dare you if they got a little girl in the house that's sick, just go over there and cry over that precious little thing and lay your hands on it in Jesus' name and pray for it and let it get well and see what happens. Oh, can we do that, Brother Elder? Why can't you do it? Are you a believer? These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. That would scare me to death to do that, Brother Elder. I'll probably get my Bible study chart and get out of there. You better start praying and fasting, sounds to me like. Hello. So it sounds to me like you better start praying and fasting. These demonic spirits ain't supposed to scare you like this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Witnessing in adversity. I'm telling you, there is no comfort zone in being an effective witness for Jesus Christ. But there is an exciting place. And there is an awesome place. There's no place to go out there and say, oh boy, this feels good and comfortable. I believe we'll go in here and witness today. You're going to go somewhere where it feels bad to be an effective witness for Christ. The fact is, my wife said to me the other day, she said, well, we was praying for the Lord to give us souls. And, and I told her, I said, you know something, baby? She said, what? I said, sometimes we think we got people in church really going to do good, and they don't. I said, we got other folks come to church. We don't think they ever do nothing. And they do. I said, in this kind of business, you can't even tell when you got a gold nugget. It's all walking by faith. It's all trusting in the Lord. It's all seeking His name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. But God knows because it's His church. And He's the one that's calling them unto Him. All we got to do is be effective witnesses. I did say effective witnesses. Which means you got to go out there and get involved in things you don't like. Brother Nathan, he brought me a turkey last night. Bless his heart. And I really appreciate it too. I love wild turkey. And I was going to clean it last night. And he taught me something last night. I knew it already. I just don't know why I never did do it. I put on a great big pot of boiling water and he dropped that turkey down in there and plucked that thing. Boy, it's pretty since it's all plucked out. You say, oh, what's so pretty about it? Well, what's so pretty about the turkey you bought at the store that's all plucked out? <laughs> Some of you young women are nuts, you know that? I feel sorry for you if they ever close a grocery store down and you have to eat. You'll learn real quick. 
God, when I grew up, we plucked chickens. And I'll tell you, that turkey didn't stink nothing like a chicken does. Did it? My lens ain't nothing stinks like a chicken. And all of you probably run out of here today for dinner and eat some. What are you talking about that old turkey for, Brother Elder? While my mouth laid in bed last night and then and then buds is going squirt, 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 squirt. I was thinking about smoking it. I was thinking about shooting this in it and that and how to keep that meat tender and and then I cook it this long and that squirt, 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 squirt. So, man, I said it's going to taste good when I get done with it. Squirt, 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 squirt. Oh, it's going to taste good, and I ain't even started cooking it yet. Did you notice? <laughs> I noticed last night, <clears throat> old brother Nathan, he plucked all them feathers off. Man, that old bird was looking prettier. The more feathers he got off of it, the prettier that bird was getting. Amen. And he cleaned that thing down good. And then he cut the back end of it open and stuck his arm in there. Yeah, and you wanted out of there. I noticed you left pretty quick. You and John. Man, I'm telling you, the whole scenery changed. Some of you ain't looking too hungry right now. (laughs) What in the world are you talking about now, Brother Elder? I'm telling you something. To have something really good you got to go through the nasty job first. You got to go through the nasty job first before it gets nice and yummy. Most folks who have thought about that said, ooh, throw that bird away. Let the dogs eat it. Let, uh, uh, uh. Ain't no dog eating my turkey. I can do the dirty job. I can do the nasty job. I appreciate Brother Nathan not letting me do it last night. I said, I'll clean that turkey. No, you ain't neither. Get out. I said, well, if you ain't going to let me do nothing, I'm going to go put my clothes back on so I can go to the hospital. i got to go to the hospital and do some visitation. Praise God. He cleaned that turkey for me. Him and him and, and like you said, John. John. John stood there and got quiet. And quite an uh, uh, <coughs> an experience. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> I probably ought not to say this. I told Nathan I'm going to go in, give this foot to my wife, tell her she can hold this tonight, and keep her hands warm. Well, Nathan didn't think I ought to do that. It'd be a good way to die young. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you saying all that stuff, Brother Elder? Yeah, you got to do the dirty work. You got to do the dirty job. Something nobody else wants to do. You got to get that dirty, nasty old sinner out of that dirty, rotten mess he's in. You got to fast and pray. God deliver him. Oh, God. You got to do that before you go teach this Bible study. You got to, oh, and you got to take the precious word and feed him. I said feed him. I didn't say stuff it. I got little grandchildren, I don't say, open your mouth. You know children trust you. 
Now open your mouth. You shove the whole banana in there. Now chew it. Come on, that's the way some of us try to win people to God. We give them from Genesis to Revolution the first time. I said feed them. Feed them. You can make them eat when they don't want to eat. Yeah, I got dogs. Sometimes they don't want to eat, so I, I do things to make them eat. There's something about a dog cannot resist the smell of meat. You take meat grease and pour it on dry dog food and they'll eat that dry dog food every time because they're trying to get to that meat. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Come on, church. Feed them. Feed them. And when you gave them something to eat, Oh, I don't know where my wife and I, we was out yesterday morning for breakfast. This woman pouring coffee in this and she said, Do you want some more? I said, Ma'am, I want some more, but I can't hold no more. There comes a place where you have eight. Do you understand that we have to know when they have gotten full? I appreciate my wife because, see, my mom and dad made me clean my plate, so I think you had to clean your plate. But when my, when my grandchildren come down, my wife watches what they eat, and she looks at me, and she makes the grand total announcement. Grandpa, what? They have ate enough. Yes, ma'am. Clean your plate. No, don't make them clean their plate no more because one day Collie filled my truck seat. I said, nope, ain't gonna make this kid eat more than he's supposed to. No more. Do you understand that when you feed something, you don't fill it up till it regurgitates? Praise God. What are you talking about, Brother Elder? Our presentation, the way we're doing it. Amen. How many of you believe it's time to feed the lost? Feed the lost. My God, if you give them a little bit, do you? Just because you understand Acts 2.38, just because you understand that God was manifested in the flesh, just because I can quote uh, Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 4, just because I can quote Isaiah 44 and 6 and 8, just because I can quote Isaiah 9 and 6, just because I can quote uh, Isaiah 43 and 10 and 11, just because I can quote uh, Matthew 1 and 23 and 26, and just because I can quote uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 19 and just because I can quote 1 Timothy 3 and 16 and just because I can quote you want me to keep going on just the oneness of the Godhead Hebrews 1 and 8 uh, just because I can quote uh, Revelations 2 and 1 just because I can quote I can just stay here on the Godhead see and just quote quote can you eat that? And we get anointed. And the poor little thing sitting over there looking at us. Go, hoo, hoo. And we ain't even figured it out yet. Feed them. Feed them till they want to come back. If I make you sick, do you think I'm going to get you back? I noticed something this last year. I'm a connoisseur of food. I said food. I even believe I could eat chocolate covered grasshoppers, especially if I got hungry enough. Never seen them, never tried it, but I bet it wouldn't be all that bad. <laughs> Don't tip me too much. Might try it. Praise God. Oh, man, it won't hurt you. It's high in protein. Connoisseur food, see? But I've learned something this year. Oh, I love Spanish food, brother. Don't, don't love it. In fact, is, I better not say that. I'll hurt somebody's feelings. But uh, I love Spanish food. Mm. 
He loves me too. Praise God. Well, one of these days you're going to show me what an Indian taco is. Everybody keeps telling me. Praise God. I always eat it if it don't eat me first. Praise God. Amen. Chinese food. I stopped the other day and got me egg roll. Eat on the road. That little old store over there in Burton on the highway has got the best Chinese eggs rolls there is. Better than any Chinese restaurant you ever stopped and got one in. Praise God. And I can't hardly drive by that place without stopping and getting me a Chinese egg roll. Yeah. I love Chinese food too. Man, I love Arkansas's food. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy. That stuff will chase you out the front door. I love my raisin. Man, you give me some good old northern beans cooked up in a thick pot of pork rind and some good old biscuits and butter and you done got me halfway to heaven. You know, I said all that to say this, that I noticed something this year in eating. That after you eat something, no matter how good it is, after a while it don't taste good anymore. There is a built-in system in us that God put in us that after we have ate enough, it says it don't taste good now. Did you ever notice, Brother Alio, when you come off of a roof or a hard day on construction and stuff, and you come home, your wife's got that favorite meal there, and man, the first run is just awesome. And the second run's not quite as good as the first run. And the third run, now you're just sitting there chunking along. many of you think we need to learn when to stop? Two hour Bible studies is too much. Most generally an hour for most of you folks is too much. Because you're into ramble and jamble now because you're trying to fill in an hour. Just teach what you got. Don't stay there and visit so long they'll be glad to see you leave. What you got make it so exciting, it's so good that it tasted so wonderful while you was there. They're looking forward to you coming back next week. Praise God. Praise God. There's women that's come to this church, and my wife said they're going to fix so and so and so, and man, I wasn't even late for dinner. Because I knew how they could fry chicken. I knew how they could bake a cherry pie. I knew how they could make an apple pie. I knew how, there's some women in here that can do some things with Spanish food that just nearly make you run out the door. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You just know when certain people are fixing something, you know, praise God. Sister Dean's taught every woman in here how to make those pies which got I don't know, some kind of cream on them. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I tell you, and she is the best cake maker. Lord, when that woman makes a cake, I'm going to be there. Because she leaves enough moisture in that cake that you don't have powder blowing out your ears while you're trying to swallow it. Praise God. Praise God. Some people make a cake, it's so dry, you, you wonder if they put any water in the flour. They just took it out of the sack and somehow got it turned into a cake. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise God. 
Oh, that's Sister Dean, man. I don't know how she gets all that moisture in a cake when she's through with it. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's just some folks know how to present something. Do you want to learn how to present something? How many of you want it so that some folks are looking forward to you to come? Open the door up. Say hi. You don't even get a chance to knock on the door. Praise God. They're looking for you to come. Amen. Anybody in here want to be an effective witness for the Lord? I mean, you, you held up your hand for church. You still want to be one? Just go out and do it. You say, I don't know how to do it. Just go out and do it. You didn't know how to drive a car. But you didn't sit around all your life and say, I ain't driving because I don't know how. You learn how. Why, it's so much more fun than riding a bicycle, it ain't funny. Come on! It's even faster. Takes me about 20 minutes to get from the house to here, but on a bicycle I'd have to get a real early start. Praise God. Hallelujah. May even have to carry breakfast or lunch with me before God hears something. Amen. I learned how to drive a car. Did anybody laugh while you was learning how to drive a car? See, everybody goes to driver's ed anymore. Yeah, we had driver's ed, all right. It was dangerous to be on the street while we was in driver's ed. You prayed no trains was coming down the track because for some reason we always got to go to the country to learn. And if that car ever did stall while you was trying to learn how to get it into second gear, it was on the train track. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. See, you you young kids, you don't know nothing. You just go over there where they teach you this, that. Of course, I bet some of you got some good experiences in them driver's ed classes. I know you scared somebody pretty bad if it wasn't nobody but the teacher. Praise God. Hallelujah. What do you do? You got out there and you learn how to drive it. Brother Elio, you ever drive big trucks? I tell you when you're good and you can drive a big truck. You put that clutch in. I used to show the men the churches stuff all the time. I, I can't absolutely say I ever had one man that caught on. I might have been Brother Williams could do. You put that big old truck in gear and you push in on that clutch. And you start that truck out and you get that truck going and you let up off the clutch and then you let up off the gas and you pull that thing in, shove it in another gear. You don't touch clutch no more now. You don't need the clutch no more. And you just keep it going. You keep going through the gears. Keep going through the gears. You, you know, it's, it's easy. Anybody can do it. Okay, I'll go watch it. My boy used to say, show me, Dad, show me. We had an old car that had first, second, and third, you know, and I'd be going down the road, and, and they'd be in second gear. he said, show me how to do it, and I'd lit up off the gas in the car and pull it from second gear down to third gear and never touch the clutch. He said, that's cool, man, that's cool. How you do that? Nothing to it, you just do it, you know. Try it. Oh, I better not say that to these women. My God, the men in this church would be so mad at me. Tearing up transmissions and clutches. What are you saying, Brother Elder? You don't get good at nothing if you don't do it. You can't get good at praying if you don't do it. You can't get good at witnessing if you don't do it. You can't get good at driving if you don't do it. I sit there and watch Brother Massey one day, Renee. I was sitting up in that big old truck with him. He took off with that truck. I said, I'm going to find out what kind of driver this dude is right now. He took off, man, that big old truck. Had that thing. 
ball and under 92,000 pounds of grain. He pulled her out of second gear. He went to clutch on second gear. And I thought, man, he's, he's going to clutch it all the way. And he went to clutch on second gear. And I kept watching him push that baby. And all of a sudden, he lit off of that. And I heard that engine come down. And he pulled her right down. I said, oh, yeah, he's a truck driver. You got to listen to that engine. That engine tells you everything. get good at it. Roy Lee Jones, man, the first time I seen him do that, I thought, what kind of a guy is this? He went through all ten gears, never touched that clutch. He said, ain't nothing to it, man. Just get over here and do it. So I got over there. There wasn't nothing to it. You ought to have heard all the grinding and the carrying on. And Praise God. Hallelujah. But I can do it now. I can take electric rear end and I can push her up and pull that electric rear end and lit off of that accelerator and listen to her come in. And you know what most of them will do every time? Push on the gas before it comes in and strip that rear end out. I can take that electric rear end and shove her down and come down with the foot feet at the same time and make that electric rear end jump into a lower gear and start pulling itself down and never miss it. I could never teach nobody in this church that, so I made them quit driving big buses because all they could do is tear up rear ends. Praise God. You learn. To be good at what you're doing. How many of you want to be good for the Lord? It's hard. You better know it's hard. There's a lot of things you have to do. Number one thing you have to do is pay attention to yourself. Pay attention how you're reacting. Pay attention how effective you are at what you're doing. Hallelujah. Anything I can't stand, I didn't preach nothing I couldn't preach. More. Anything I can't stand is failure. No, I'm not talking about in your life. I'm talking about in my life. If I can't do it, I'm going to do it till I can do it. There's no such a thing as I can't do it. Now, they might be in your life, but there's not in my life. If I can't do it, I'm going to do it. I was watching them little old boys the other day. <laughs> the blessed little old hearts are cute, man. They take them yo-yos and throw them down. They got these fancy new yo-yos now. Know when to come back. I watched them boys out there throw them yo-yos down and walk the dog, you know. I know you think I'm just bragging this morning. I used to be a yo-yo champ, and I didn't know this, but my wife used to be pretty good on yo-yo. Oh, yeah, pull that baby up and rock about, baby. Go around the world and do... I can't even remember what we call these. And I was watching them boys. It was funny watching them and the girls would get started. And that even gets funnier when you watch the girls done it. And some of them girls are going whip some of them boys. You know why? I could look in those girls' eyes and ask them. They was serious about what they was doing. These boys ain't going to do nothing we can't do. That's the way women are anymore. They're going to show every man in the country up. Hello. How many of you think we ought to get that serious about being effective preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Bless God, you get good at it. You know why? Them boys are getting good at it. You know why? They sit out there on their porch all day long, walking the dog, going around the world, rocking the baby. Amen. Doing the twirls and around the worlds and 
And they do it and they're doing it, doing it and 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 doing it. I don't know, maybe they're going to be in a contest or something. Amen, somewhere. So, you know, you can't ever tell. Win a new bass boat or something. How do you know? Praise God. Hallelujah. They're just getting good at it. Getting, but it's competition amongst each other. How many of you think it would be good if we ever got that excited about taking this glorious gospel out? <laughs> working it and working it. <laughs> Praise God, because we can do it as good as anybody in the church can do it. Hello. I don't believe we ought to have competition, Brother Elder. Well, it sure don't hurt me none. It don't hurt me none. Praise God. I'm telling you, when I get out with a guy, I just, I just tell you what, it's just pressure to fish with Brother Dudley. But bless God, I'm going anyhow. Hallelujah. Amen. You say, well, what, what, what? What do you go fishing with him for if it's pressure? Well, how would you like to go fishing with me? I put that same pressure on a lot of people. If it's good enough to put it out, it's good enough to take it. Praise God. Praise God. Come on. Better. Skill. Sharpen. Last night I had to clean that turkey and I said, man, this, this thing, this ain't going to work. This stuff's tough. I went over there and I got my spatial knife out there to cut anything. And I got that knife sharpener out and I started in. I could take up and shave with that knife before I started in on that turkey last night. Praise God. What do you do? You learn. You learn. You learn. You get skillful at everything you're doing. How many of you want to get skillful that you know when to go to Acts 10 and 44? That you know when to go to Acts 9 and 6. How many of you want to get to where? Oh, hallelujah. We don't need to go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 19. No, no, no. We need to go to to St. John 14 and 26. Because we're talking about the Holy Ghost now. Praise God. Get them in you. Get them in you. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Get excited about it. Get the hackles up on your back. Praise God. Amen. I get more excited about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ than I ever did about fishing or shooting. I'm going to tell you something, buddy. There is something awesome about shooting a wild turkey. Nathan sat there and talked to me last night about shooting those turkeys yesterday, and it's all I could do to stand. I wanted to say, why don't you shut up? Why don't you just shut up? I didn't get to go with you. Why don't you just shut up? You just don't know the feeling of a wild turkey coming on you and you're talking back to it and it's making love to you and it's coming up to you and, and that dude's getting within gun range and you're just about to give him some uh, unsuspected stuff he never thought of. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, the, it, it makes hair stand up on you, brother. It, it just does all kinds of stuff to you. Amen. I don't know how to explain it to you. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you something. Preaching the glorious gospel does more for me than that does. Amen. Amen. Getting some Boy, you get somebody come out of these seats this morning and come up here and get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell all of you something in here. You don't have to know how to get the Holy Ghost if you want it. You just got to be hungry enough for it to get it. I preached to a bunch of prisoners last Wednesday night and I said, if you're hungry, you will get it. And I watched a black boy last week who was hungry for it and was following everything I was doing while I was teaching and, and preaching and showing it to him. And I could see it was all over him and he wanted it back. And, and, and all of those men out there, one gets lost in the stuff and they come to the altar and I prayed with him last week and it didn't seem like nothing would help him or nothing and I prayed with a bunch of them and, and some of the other men helping us pray up and down through there and I'm trying to get some of them to, to get hungry to get the Holy Ghost, you know, and, and I don't know what to do to make them hungry enough to get the Holy Ghost because it's hard to make somebody hungry for the Holy Ghost if they ain't hungry for it. And I was way over here in the corner praying for this black guy. Way over here in the corner praying. praying. And we wasn't getting nowhere. And I said, oh God. 
sure we something happened. I, and I turn around and I looked and there's this black guy that's hungry for the Holy Ghost. And he is really hungry and I can see it. And I took one step forward like that when I seen him. And the Holy Ghost came all over me when I did. And I laid my hands on him. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, speak in other tongues. And that man started talking in tongues and started talking in tongues. Twenty some minutes later, he was talking in tongues. Uh, they was taking him out of there, speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. He was getting something he'd never got before in his entire life. Why? Because he was hungry for it. Uh, he was ready for it. Amen. Uh, yes, Lord. I'm here. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Hallelujah. Just give me the Holy Ghost. That's where you got to get when you want the Holy Ghost. It ain't because you understand it. You'll never understand the Holy Ghost. You got to be hungry for it to get it. Every man is filled when he's hungry. Every man's quenched his thirst when he's thirsty. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I'm here to tell you something this morning. If you're hungry and thirsting for it, it's here. It's for you. But if you ain't hungry and thirsty for it, and you're just nonchalant, you don't really want it, we couldn't make you get it if we tried. Amen. This thing comes from heaven. You got to get it because you're thirsty for it. You got to get it because you're hungry for it. You ain't going to get it because you just come here and be bopped down on a pew. You got to get up there and pray like you want it. My wife and I, we slept in a motel night before last. That's the worst bed I can remember sleeping on in years. We slept on it this way, and then we slept on it that way, and then we slept just whichever way. We turned completely around on it. And when we both got up, we were both so messed up it wasn't funny. And I went in and laid down. When I got home from driving yesterday, I was, I was just beat up. Preached my guts out Friday night, and God did a marvelous thing. Hallelujah. Tried to sleep and couldn't. Drove for three hours yesterday and was tired, and I got home and went in and laid down on there. But wife said something about eating. I was hungry. I didn't lay on the bed. No way. Now when it's time to eat. What about it? Are you hungry or not? It's eating time. It's time to come up to the altar and get the Holy Ghost if you're hungry. Oh, pray for me. Do this. Pray for me. No, if you're hungry, you get up here and get it. You don't need four or five guys shaking you on each side. Come on now, turn loose. This guy over here, come on, hang on. Hang on, this guy over here, turn loose, turn loose. Brother, when you get hungry, you get up here. You don't care if this guy's saying turn loose. You don't care if this guy's saying hang on. You're up here, you're going to get what you want from God. Because you're hungry. Hallelujah. Let's stand this morning. I fought the devil all the way through this thing this morning, but I'm going to tell you one thing. God's still going to pour out a mighty revival in this house. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Jesus, Jesus is. is.